Good morning. We're about ready to start, and I just want to remind you again, if you would be please silence your cell phones. That will help us in case somebody tries to call you and disrupt the class. And if you need to use your cell phone, just please you go to the back and use the run the restrooms. If your men's are on the left, ladies on the right, or if you can want, you can go outside. All right. So thank you for being here this morning. We got uh, it's about time to start. Uh, we're going to finish up. This is the last Sunday on the church membership. Ken will be back next Sunday if the Lord tarries. All right. Amen. Yeah. Um, he'll be back next Sunday and we'll be back in first John. He'll be finishing up on first John. Praise God. Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer this morning, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come to you and say thank you for giving us your word. Your word is truth. It's the only truth that we need to seek. And Lord, we thank you that from your word, you can lead and guide us in all truth. And as you said, Lord, that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We want to be a church that proclaims not only the, the one true gospel, but we want to have our theology right. As we live in a time when there are so many churches that are false doctrines and false prophets and teachers, we certainly do not want to join their ranks. We want to be a remnant church that proclaims the truth and help people to come to the knowledge of truth by rightly dividing the word of God. We thank you today. Now, Lord, Holy Spirit, you teach us, you guide us. You be the teacher. And let everything that's said and done glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we, we kind of started off on uh, what this church was about and, you know, and why be a church member. And we went from that to our, our um, resolutions. And our resolutions reflect the doctrines that we teach. And then last week we started on our fundamental doctrines, the essentials of the faith. And those are very important because if you don't have a faith, what good is it, right? Okay. So uh, when I say core doctrines, if you can go to um, the next slide, the Bundle Life Fellowship has 16 core doctrines, and those core doctrines are the absolute truths that we hold to. Okay, they're not debatable. They, we hold to them. And it's not something that we come up with, that God came up with them, and the early church taught it. And so we're going to teach it here continuously. And I said that uh, these teachings are going to show up in our messages. They're going to show up in our Bible studies. They're going to show up... Uh, in our uh, edification of one another. They're, they're going to be showing up in our devotion, in our prayer times, and that's why you need to know them. And once again, it's so important uh, as we earnestly contend for the faith, and we're going to look at a few scriptures here in just a minute that I need you to open your Bibles, but anyone who does not hold to these doctrines fully cannot become a member of a Bundle Life Fellowship. We just can't, and here's why. If you will turn to me with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here's why. How many know there cannot be any division in the church? Not one ounce of division. Okay, now we can have different opinions. That's not the problem, okay? Um, you may like a certain color. I like red, you may like blue, okay? Um, pizzas, you may like just cheese pizza. No meat on it, I love meat lovers pizza, okay? Uh, I like my steak kind of rare. Some people like it well done. So you see, we're not talking about that. We have our differences of opinions, tastes, and dislikes and likes. That's not what's important. What's important is that we stand firm on what we believe. And that's what Paul was dealing with here in the church of Corinth. There was a lot of division going on, and the main problem was they weren't standing true to God's word. Now let's look at this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.10. It's not up here, so you're going to have to turn to your Bibles. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1.10, then we're going to look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. And then we're going to look at Jude, the book of Jude. Once again, I'm asking you to please turn in your Bibles to these. I'll read them. Now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I plead with you, brethren. Brethren always means what? Church. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now notice, same mind, same judgment. It means that everything that you judge, you judge according to God's word. If we are going to judge what is truth and what is error, we have to be together on doctrine. Amen? Does everybody understand that? Look what Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3 verse 24 if you will turn there please Mark's gospel chapter 3 verse 24 a very familiar passage of scripture and it goes for the church at this time the Pharisees were 
claiming that Jesus was Satan, yet Jesus was doing nothing but exposing Satan. And Jesus said in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 24, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. It's the same with the church. We cannot be divided. We can't say, well, I believe this doctrine and someone else says I believe something else. Um, no. When we have to go to scriptures and clearly understand what the scriptures teach. Please go with me, if you can, to Jude. Way back, Jude, right after 3 John. Jude is the half-brother of Jesus, and look what he says in verse 3. Everybody there? Jude. There are no chapters in Jude. There's, there's one chapter, if you want to put it that way. So it's Jude 3. Beloved, while I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Notice Jude says, our common salvation. That means we're all in the same boat. When it, concerning salvation. Remember, we talked about that last week. What do we believe about salvation? How are we saved? We're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. Amen? Okay? Not, not by works. Right? Good works follow salvation. Right? I've often said the fruit of the Spirit, which is good works, is, is, is not the root of salvation. Christ is the root. But the fruit of salvation is the is the good work. So if you think you can earn your salvation, you're not going to earn it, and you're going to spend eternity uh, in, in eternal death and hell because that, there are a lot of this t these teachings coming up again. Uh, they're called uh, Sabbatarian teachings. You've got to worship on Saturday. You've got to keep the law. You've got to do this and that. Of course we want to honor God and do what's right in God's eyes, but if you think that's going to add to your salvation, you're sadly mistaken because the Bible says we are saved by grace and grace alone. Okay, and so what Jude is speaking about here, he says, I, I, I write to you to, uh, concerning your common salvation. I found it necessary to write exhorting you to what? Contend earnestly for the faith. Contend means to protect it, to stand firm in it, and don't let anything move you away, okay? Because it's the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Does everybody see that? All right, so does anybody have any questions on that? So what we're going to be looking at is the remainder of the 16 core doctrines that we hold to this morning. Uh, last week we kind of run into an issue because um, one of those was out of place and we were missing one and I found it. So let's go back and pick up with uh, a, a number nine. Um, this will be a, be a little bit of a review. And once again, if you have your Bibles with you, please. Um, let's... Um, read them, I'll pass the mic around, it'll help me out. The New Testament church, which we are, started on the day of Pentecost, how many know that? When the Holy Spirit came upon the believers. Jesus said it's the ecclesia, the called out ones. Upon this rock, Jesus said, my church will be built, the rock of Jesus, the truth of God's word. It is made up of true believers in Christ. When I say true believers, I'm people who have repented of their sins, and believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior and Lord. We talked about that last week. Jesus is the only way. There are no other way. He's the only means for salvation. It's made up of true believers, birthed on the day of Pentecost, and will be dis discontinued at the rapture, and has been given the command by Jesus to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Now, we talked about that last week a little bit. I want to just go ahead and tell you again. The, the purpose of Abundant Life Fellowship is to... Preach the gospel and make disciples. That's what this church is all about. We're not here to put on a bunch of programs. Some programs are nice, you know. But what good is our faith if we're not sharing it with the lost? Think about it. What good is it if you believe in Jesus, but you never tell anybody who Jesus is? The Bible says we are to be witnesses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Word of God clearly teaches that when the Holy Spirit came upon you, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, ye shall be my witnesses. Where? First in Jerusalem. That's where the church was birthed. On the day of Pentecost. First in Jerusalem. Then where? Then Judea. Spreading out. The gospel is being spread out. The church is growing. Then Samaria. 
than the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, Ocala, Florida is in the uttermost parts of the earth, okay? All right, you can't go much farther south. We can go a little farther south, but we are to be witnesses in this area, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, not telling people to come to Jesus to get rich, as all these false word of faith churches are teaching. Come to Jesus to get saved. Why? Because Jesus didn't suffer and die on that cross. He didn't drink in God's wrath for you and I to be blessed and live a blessed life. Because I got news for you. Most Christians in the world do not live a, what we call a financially blessed life. See, in America, we can believe that. But here, uh, you go look at what, how Christians are living in countries such as, think about it, North Korea. There are Christians in North Korea. And if they're even caught worshiping the Lord, they'll kill them. How rich do you think they are? How blessed do you think they are to have... They have the, the best of life. No, but they, they, they put American Christians to shame. What about the Christians in, in places like China? Think about them tonight, today. What about the Christians in places, you know, like um, uh, Iran, Iraq, you know, that, 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 that's a predominantly Islamic countries. So the, the purpose of the church is to preach the gospel and to make disciples. Not so clearly... Uh, taught. Let's look at this again. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus told them. This is right before he ascended into heaven, right before he was taken up. He says, now that I have taught you for three and a half years, go and wait in Jerusalem to be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will empower you to go and make disciples. And they did that. They did that. They were preaching the gospel every day from the time that the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter was the first one to preach the message, so clearly detailed in Acts chapter 2. Are you with me today? And all of them preached, and that's why the, the, the Christianity grew. It, it spread throughout Israel into Asia Minor and even into Europe. But uh, Satan corrupted it later. But see, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Well, how, how many know America is part of that, right? baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Jesus said, teaching them things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That means I'm with you by the Holy Spirit, right? So that's a little bit of, just a little bit of a review on that because I want you to realize what our church is about. We're going to follow that here. And it has been difficult. I could preach an hour on this. Because when I became the pastor here, the church here wanted to be a, a um, charismatic, let's just have a, a party church. And, you know, and, and, you know, just whoop it up here and go outside and do nothing for the rest of the week. What good is your faith? See, brother and sister, that's what I'm trying to, trying to get across to you. What good is it if you can sh jump and shout in church and yell amen and hallelujah, but no one out there in the world knows you are even a believer? That to me is, it's, 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 it's almost like you're mocking God. People around you should know who, where you stand. They may not like it. And they may even co confront you. They may even treat you bad for being a Christian. Did Jesus promise you that would happen? Did Jesus promise you that would happen? Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. He said the world's going to hate you. If the world hated me, they're going to hate you. But that's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about if we can plant the seeds of the gospel, that the gospel would get into the hearts of someone somewhere, and eventually, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that seed will take root, and they'll become saved. Amen. All right, so don't ever worry about, oh, well, I told someone about Jesus, and they rejected me. Well, you told them, maybe then later on they will receive. How many of you are like me? I had to hear it several times before it finally got in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't ever think that, just because they don't receive you doesn't mean they won't let later. So you, we want to be a witnessing church. We want to be a, a disciple-making church. Disciple means that we are going to be disciplined followers of Christ. All right. Number 10, we talked about a little bit last week. We're going to uh, again talk about this because um, someone asked, again, is baptism, um, does baptism save you? Water baptism. Well, let's look at this. Number 10. Baptism of the repentant believer. Notice you cannot be baptized unless you are a repentant believer. That means we don't baptize infants. That's a false teaching. Children don't even know they need to repent of their sins. They only know who Jesus is. So what good is that? So when you go to these churches where they get the whole family up there and they got this child all dressed up and the priest or the pastor dabs with water and they go through all that rigmarole, all they did was make that child's hair wet if he has any hair. 
That's all. Nothing good comes out of that. It's just a religious show. Because true water baptism, as taught in the Word of God, you always see from the time of John baptizing at the Jordan River, where Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River, to every believer being baptized, they were dunked under the water in the rivers. No one was dabbed. So why do we think that we can change that? The word baptism in the Greek is the, like I said last week, is baptismal. And it means to be fully immersed or dunked, okay? So baptism here, and we have a baptistry behind the screen. Uh, it needs a little bit of fixing up, um, but we have baptized many people back there. So if you have not been baptized since you come to know Christ, please see me. We'll baptize you, okay? Baptism of the repentance believer in water, a holy act of uh, command by God, God's word. That means the body of the believer is immersed completely underwater. In this act of obedience, all you're saying is, I am a new creature in Christ. Once again, go into the water as your old man coming up as the new man. You're identifying with the death, burial, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does everybody understand that? All right. Um, Romans 6, 4, and then, we're gonna, then we'll pick it up because that's where we left off. Therefore, we are buried with him by what? Yeah. Baptism into death. All right? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. All right? Um, someone asked me that should they be baptized again? If you have never really repented of your sins, you should make another confession of your faith and be baptized. Once again, baptism does not save you. Because that's a works. But you've got some churches that teach you, oh, if you're not saved or baptized, you're not saved. No, 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 no. The Bible says, clearly teaches. Now, they take Mark 16, 15 out of context. Ken, do you have that, Mark 16, 15? Yeah. Uh, I had an individual, uh, one of these um, old-time Pentecostals, and they, they believe that you've got to be baptized. If you're not baptized, you're going right to hell. Um, so they say you get saved. I, I try to talk to her. Let's say you got saved on a Saturday night and you're on your way to be baptized on, on Sunday morning and you get in a, killed in a car wreck. Is God going to send you to hell? No. All right. No. All right. All right. Uh, Mark 16, 15 says... You need to turn yellow up, please. Uh, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye and all to... And, excuse me. Go in ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature mm -hmm. he who believes and is baptized shall be saved but he who believes not shall be shall be damned okay so notice Jesus said he who believes not he didn't say he who believes not and or is not baptized is condemned so of course we should be baptized it, it's one of the ordinances that Christ gave it's a very important ordinance and we take it very serious here but once again it's not for salvation it is after salvation does everybody understand that Okay, and how many of you here have been baptized by immersion? All right, you need, if you haven't, you need to be, okay? All right, just want to let you know that. Okay, so now let's pick it up. Um, last week we, we practiced this, the Lord's Memorial, call, commonly called the Holy Communion, is to be practiced by all believers, continually as a time to remember and reflect upon Christ's sacrificial suffering and death for our sins, as well as a time to examine one's faith in light of his soon return. Now, I t touched on a little bit, but I want the reason why I'm repeating is this is very important. Abundant Life Fellowship is a church that preaches holiness, righteousness, and repentance. I'm going to say it again, because I think some of you might have missed it. We are a church that preaches holiness, righteousness, and repentance. When we say holiness, we're not talking about we are to live perfect, because that's what a lot of people believe. Oh, you're one of them, that you believe everybody can't make a mistake. No, we're not saying that at all. You're saying that no one can live in sin or have sin. No, listen, you can fall into sin, but you're not to live in sin, right? Holiness simply means that you're separating yourself from this wicked world. That's all it means. God is separate from the world. We need to be separate. We live in this world, but we're not to act like the world, right? So every time we do communion here, now some churches do it maybe once every six months. Um, some may do it every week. It, the, the important part is, what are you doing when you're taking Holy Communion? You're, re, you're remembering the bride price that Christ paid. You understood what that whole cup was, the cup of, that was set before the bride. What was that? That was to say, 
do you accept what I've done for you? It was a way of saying, I had Jesus, I paid the price for your sins. And by drinking this cup, you are acknowledging my death and my soon return. You're saying, I fully agree with what Jesus did on the cross. And that's why Paul said, every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you shew forth the Lord's death until he returns, right? <laughs> Let's look at that again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And um, verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's all. You're saying, I am proclaiming, I am believe that Christ suffered for me. The bread represents the broken body. Christ gave his body. He, was a, he gave himself to be a sacrifice. The, the cup, the juice, represents his shed blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. All right? So we practice that here. Now, there's an issue that I uh, faced a few times as a pastor over the years. The, the part of 1 Corinthians says, this is why a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup, so he doesn't eat and drink in an unworthy manner because that many have become sick and died. What is Paul referring to there? He's talking about if you willfully practice sin, you bring judgment upon your body. You know, people who live, live willfully in sin, you know, who, who, who are doing things that are improper are going to be uh, at risk of dying. Okay, think about it. If you're out drinking, doing drugs, or doing whatever, um, sleeping around, you can get some kind of sexually transmitted disease. Paul is just saying here, listen, when you look at that cup and you look at that bread, you, are, you need to examine your heart. That's why it's so important, because every time we do, that's our call for repentance. And when I say repent, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm just sorry what I did l last week, but I'm going to go back and do it again. It means I am turning away from it. And this is why the church is a mess in America. This is why we have these woke ministries rising up. This is why we have a social gospel, because there is no true repentance anymore. This is why we have pastors that are homosexual that are being ordained and, and homosexual people are being married in, their, in churches when God's word strictly forbids of that, as we're going to see in just a few minutes. There's no true repentance, okay? Amen? And, and, uh, and I'll comment on that in just a minute. Okay, so does everybody understand that we're going to take Holy Communion here once a month? Some have asked, why don't we do it every week? Because we say, think once a month is sufficient, all right? We're not doing it like the early church did. We're not passing around a communion cup. That's why it's called communion. It's a communion cup. They drank out of the same cup, okay? So they filled it up with wine. They said, drink, 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 pass it around. Um, because of the, uh, the situation with the pandemic, we even went to more sanitary means with the um, cellophane sealed cups and bread. It, the, the main thing is you understand, it's not the actual emblem, it's what it represents, right? Okay, any questions? All right, here's the one we missed and I just went ahead and added it at number 12. Are we ready? Sanctification. Here at Abundant Life Fellowship, we're gonna look at a lot of scriptures on this one, so get your Bibles ready. This is why I need your Bibles to be ready. We believe that sanctification is progressive, not instantaneous. When I say instantaneous, I'm saying that God sees you as perfect when you are saved, instantaneous, but the Holy Spirit cleans us up over time. Does everybody understand that? So, I mean, if you got saved yesterday, I got news for you. You're still going to struggle with the flesh for a while as the Lord cleans you up. I did. Anybody here, when you got saved, you were just... Totally sanctified and overnight? No. God begins to speak to your heart. And, and you know, there are things that I, be, had to, I wanted to give up. Some of the things I didn't want to. But old, over time, the Lord showed me why I needed to. Right? And that's called sanctification. Okay? God commands the believer to live a spirit-filled life. A life of separation from the world. And the perfecting of holiness. Now notice, in the fear of God. There's probably one of the big things that is missing in most of the church. There's no fear of God anymore. Fear of God doesn't mean you're scared to death of him. You don't even want to approach him. It means you have a, a, a right a reverence for God. You reverence him. You know that God has every right to cast you into hell. But yet, because of his love and his grace, he won't through Christ Jesus. That's the kind of respect we have to have for the Lord. Okay, you know what I mean? 
We don't treat him like he's our buddy buddy. We don't treat Jesus like he's our buddy buddy. He is God. Okay? I have a problem with these churches that they just make Jesus out to be this guy that, you know, I, you know the Lord showed up and talked to me today and we had a cup of coffee and, you know, calling yeah, call him daddy and all that. He is our heavenly father. Uh, God is. Jesus is the son. All right, so Jesus is. So it's a life of separation from the world and the perfecting of holiness in the fear of God as an expression of our Christian faith. Once again, we go back to the Christian faith. What good is our faith if we don't live it? Right? We can agree to it all we want on Sunday, but what good is it if we don't live it Monday through Saturday? It's the expression of our Christian faith being complete and equipped for every good work. Now, we talk about that a lot in this church, out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. What? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. There's your, 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 your truths. And it's for reproving. That means rebuking, convicting. And instruction in righteousness. There for the equipping. For we may be complete, equipped. Well, you can't be equipped if you're not living a sanctified life. Okay? You're not going to be properly equipped. You're going to make yourself out to be a hypocrite, and, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, okay? All right, now, this is clearly taught in Ephesians 4, 11 through 32, but let's look at a few verses that teach us this, and then we're going to look at, I'm going to have you open your Bibles. 2 Corinthians six seventeen. And I'm going to ask you to open there, because let's look at all of that. 2 Corinthians six seventeen, And we've got to get through all these, so we're going to go quick. So we, we won't pick this up again next week. We've got to get through it. How many know the, the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? And by the way, you've got to read all that, and also you've got to go to the 2 Corinthians 7.1, because that should be part of that. All right, can, who has it? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 and following. I, I do, Pastor. Right, okay, go ahead and read it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.17 mm -hmm. says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Right there it says, what? Perfecting what? Holiness. In the what? In the fear of the, the Lord. In the fear of God. Fear of God. You see that? Yeah. All right, so perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Go on ahead and go read the rest of it. Uh, the same chapter? Yep. Same. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before, you are in our hearts to live, excuse me, to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, and great is my glorying of you. All right, I'm, I'm sorry. I sh you should have stopped at 7 1. I thought, okay, you're good. I did. Yeah, you're good. All right. So I just want to make sure you pay attention to 7 1 because 6, 2 Corinthians 6 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them. 2 Corinthians 6 17. Let's look at that. Wherefore come out from among them. Who is them there? The world. Come out from this wicked world. We're not to love the world, right? Do not love the world, James writes. Right? Do not love the world, right? John says, Do not love the world. Why? For all that's in the world. Is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life, right? None of that's from God. doesn't mean we hate people in the world. It just means we hate the sin of this wicked world. Why? Because who's the author? Who's the God of this age? Satan, right? So come out from among them and separate, be separate, said the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. That means don't have anything to do with anything that God says is wicked or sinful. And then I will receive you. Notice that is a life of repentance. It doesn't say, I'll receive you, then go separate yourself from the world. God receives us after repentance. And that's so clearly taught. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you, right? Repent, right? So we've got to draw nigh to God through a heart of repentance. Does everybody see this? Let's look at 1 John 2, 15 and 17. And you got it, thank you. Do not love the world, John writes, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, now the word love there is the same word that is found in John 3.16, agapia. 
It means don't commit yourself to the things of the world. Love there doesn't just mean a feelings. It means don't be committed to doing the things of the world. Don't have anything to do with them. So do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world or is committed to doing things like the world, obviously the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have the Holy Spirit love of, uh, that leads us to holiness and righteousness and yet love the things of the world. For all that is in the world, now look at this, all that is in the world, this whole world right now until Jesus returns at the second coming, is the lust of the flesh. What do we see? We're going to talk about that today in the message. Why America is in trouble. What's going on? Look at our country. Look what we want to watch. Look what we want to see. Look what we want to hear. Look what we want to be involved in. Just watch the TV. Watch the commercials. The things that are being promoted are just absolutely an abomination. I watched a commercial of uh, a new drug that helps people with AIDS. So showing two homosexual men kissing and saying, now we, we don't have to worry about, you know, anything to just keep the lifestyle of abomination going. You know, it, it, it'd be just like if they come up with some kind of a, uh, a medication that you can overdose on drugs, you know, just keep taking drugs, and if, you know, then, but it won't kill you. It might make you a little sick, but it won't kill you, you know, yeah. Brother? You know, Pastor, we're reading this scripture here, um, John, 1 John 2, 15, 17. But the more I look at it, the more I'm seeing that what we're reading here is in the modern church today, not just in America, but in the modern church. That's exactly what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Is that what the characteristics that Paul wrote in the last days shall come perilous times? He's describing the, 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 the church in the last days. They will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasures, lovers of money rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, right? Right, right. So for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that means the feelings the flesh goes after, the eyes, well, I want to see it, I want to go after it, the watching pornography, watching things that are evil and wicked, and the boastful pride of life. Look at how people live, just boasting, so happy promoting their sin, so proud. They have the pride, you know, pride, the homosexual pride. How can you be proud of that? Something that is so contrary to God's word. Well, it's because they live for this world. It is not from the Father, but it is from Satan's world. That's what world means there. The word world there in the Greek is the word cosmos, Satan's world. The world is passing away. Yes, it is. And also is its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Remember in Matthew 7, he says, many will come to me that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many wonders in your name? But I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because they did not do the will of the Father. Only those who do the will of the Father will inherit the kingdom of God. All right. Do we have any questions on that one? Because we need to move merrily along. We've got four more to cover very quickly. Okay, so this one we talked about a little bit, and I want to re revisit it. The eternal life of the believer with the Lord and the eternal punishment of the unbeliever in the lake of fire, commonly called hell. The believer goes to be with Christ. Jesus promised that in John 14, 1, 2, and 3. At death, the unbeliever goes to judgment. When you die, when you pass from this world, your fate is sealed. There is no purgatory. How many know that? For although, we have some ex-Catholics in here, and, and uh, that is a, a doctrine that was promoted much later, but not in the Word of God. <clears throat> Once you die, you've sealed your fate. We, all, we know that. John, you know, just one example, a verse we all know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth will not perish. Perish where? In hell. All right. Does everybody see this? Okay, let's look at a few passages. Um, can I have someone please read um, 1 Thessalonians 4? Uh, let's not do that one. Let's do Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Everybody knows 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. Let's do that one. This is talking about eternal life. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Who has it? If you can pass the um, mic to them. I have it, Pastor, if nobody else raised their hand. All right, go ahead and read it, brother. All right. Um, 
Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which, uh, which go in thereat. Right. Okay, so many go in to destruction. Why is that? Because they're not going the way of truth. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Everybody understand that? Uh, could you go ahead and read Matthew 7, 21 through 23? Yes. Uh, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Okay, the, the first part of that, Jesus said, only those who do what? The will of the Father, right? right. Read that again. Uh, okay, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, okay. Lord. There. Okay, now remember, look at the Lord, Lord. They're, these are people that are going to believe they were Christians, but are finding out too late that they were not. Right. All right, go ahead and read it. And shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but, that's a big word, isn't but it? But he who does what? But he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have done, excuse me, have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. Right. And then I will profess, profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me who, who work iniquity. Right. So we have a lot of people that are not saved. They're false converts. Well, what is the will of the Father? We often say, well, isn't that just to believe? Well, obviously, the will of the Father is that we become like Christ. That's what he's talking about. To bear the fruit of the Spirit. These people, because Jesus said, they, he said, I never knew you, you workers of what? Iniquity. Iniquity, which in a, in, a, in a little bit easier understanding is lawlessness. So there was no transformation. There was no Holy Spirit doing the transformation. There was no true repentance. They came to the foot of the cross, but they never went any further. Yeah. You could also include those who weren't preaching the true gospel. In that oh, yeah, way. that's what Jesus is referring right, to there. Right. Let me, let's, let's move on real quick. I wanna, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 1, 12. That 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 12. I'm going to read this. This is talking about eternal punishment. So we do believe in hell here. We teach it. Um, there's a lot of people say, I don't want to believe in it. Of course, it's a very, very horrible place, but it's, it's real. 2 Thessalonians uh, 1, 9. Uh, let's, let's start with uh, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. That's what Jesus just said in Matthew 7. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to be truly saved. These shall be punished with what kind of destruction? Everlasting, Everlasting destruction. Now, you're going you're to have these groups of people say, I, well, I believe God may send somebody to hell, but they're just going to be annihilated. Well, why does Jesus use the word everlasting then? Everlasting means forever. Everlasting punishment and destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Okay? All right, so um, let's look at John 14, 1 to 3. We know this is a passage of scripture Jesus promised. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. So are there mansions in heaven? Yeah. Some people believe that Jesus is referring to the New Jerusalem. Doesn't matter. The fact is, there's somewhere, right? And that's talking about eternal life. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go to prepare. A, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. So we teach that the believer, true believer, is going to home with Christ when, at death or rapture. All right? Now look at this, Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is there a lake of fire? Yeah, it's called hell. Okay? Now, the, the story of the rich man, we're going to do this very soon. I'm going to do a whole teaching on this. It's not a story. It's not a, a, uh, like a parable. 
Jesus said there was a rich man and a man named Lazarus. It means this really happened. It's a little misleading because people, well, the rich man died and went right into hell. No, he went into Hades. That is the same place where all the righteous dead were, but they were in a different part. Okay, now this is, I don't want to confuse anybody, so I'm just going to quickly tell you. Jesus emptied that out when he went down and preached to the righteous dead. That's what it means in Ephesians 4, he took captive to be captive. But all those people like the rich man, Adolf Hitler, and all the, uh, the Pharisees and all are still there waiting to be judged at the great white throne judgment. They're not in the lake of fire yet. They're in torment. They're in jail before prison. That's kind of what that means. All right. But I want you to know, in this church, we're going to teach on hell. We're going to warn people of hell. It's not just a dirt, it's just not a vulgar word that people use. It is a real place, and it's, and, and it's filling up. It's going to, the people that are going there, their names are filling up on the list. Number 14. We've got we to finish up real quick. The, the reality and personality of Satan, the enemy of our God and his church, through Satan's fallen and wicked world and his false religions, false teachings, false doctrines. We teach about Satan in this church. He's not a figment of someone's imagination. Today's modern church, sadly and tragically, has put the devil in the same basket as Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. They don't talk about him. But he's a very real being, and he is the God of this age. We know that when he appeared to God in Job chapter 1, he told God, you know, God said, have you considered my servant Job? What? God allowed Satan to torment him. All right? The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's his whole purpose. Kill, steal, kill, and destroy. Does everybody see that? Let's look at a couple of verses. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians. Now let's do this one, Ephesians 4, 27. Can I get somebody besides Ken? Ephesians 4, 27. And then we're going to quickly finish up. Main thing is I want you to realize there is a being on earth called the devil. One third of fallen angels have, are working for him. We have principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, we must put on the full armor of God. You got it? Thank you. Ephesians 4.27. Neither give place to the devil. All right. Need, do not give place to the devil. Don't live in sin. Give place to the devil. Okay. He's a real being. All right. Does everybody understand that? That's the main point. So when we mention Satan in this church, we're talking about an evil, wicked, fallen angel who is the god of this age. That's exactly what... 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of them who receive not the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, number 15. We believe in the new heavens and the new earth. We, according to his promise, God's promise, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Does everybody understand that? Let's look at 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. I'm going to finish this up because we're about out of time. But according to his promise, God's promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. Why? Because the old heavens and the old earth have been corrupted by Satan. It will be destroyed by fire. When I talk about heavens, I'm not talking about the heaven where God's at. I'm talking about the heavens above. The earth below where we used to walk on. We are going to live on this earth in a place called the New Jerusalem. All right? This earth is not going to pass away. It's going to be renovated by fire. So we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will, shall dwell, because there will not be no Satan. There will be no sin. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot, blemish, and at peace. Does everybody understand that? So, right, so we, we believe that the millennial reign of Christ, as we talked about um, several weeks ago, um, or it was the last week, I think it was last week, um, is, is a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. Okay, number 16. It's sad that we have to add this one, but we had to. We believe that God created male 
and woman female, placed them in the garden. And there the Lord instituted a monogamous marriage between one male and one female as the foundation of the family, the basic structure of human society. Therefore, we reject the homosexual lifestyle, the LGBT agenda that is being openly accepted in our society as being an abomination in the sight of God and that no one who lives the homosexual lifestyle or promotes it, should be promotes it, is saved and, we will, and will eternally be lost lest they repent of this wickedness. Now, God's word so clearly teaches us, folks. This no, there is no reason for this woke theology. It's an absolute denial of God's word. We're not talking about one verse that, you know, kind of hints at that. There are verses that are so clear. Genesis 1:27, and God created male and female and put them in the garden. He didn't put two men in the garden. He didn't put two women in the garden. That's right there. Uh, Leviticus 18:22. someone look at that up. And then, uh, I got it, Pastor. We're going to look at Romans 1, 26 and 20 through 27 in the, in the message today. Go ahead, Leviticus 18, 22. Uh, yeah, Leviticus 18, 22 says, You shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. All right. In other words, you shall not, men shall not have sex with men and women with women, for it is an abomination in the sight of God. Has God changed his mind? No. No. How do we know? Well, let's look at these, these verses. Does homosexuality honor God? Now, you're going to see this verse again in the message today about God's judgment on America. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. That's a very clear de indicator of God's judgment. God gave them up means God made them become like this because they wanted to be like this. They're not going to repent. The Bible clearly teaches that if you don't have a love for the truth, God gives you over to the deception. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. These doctrines are so clearly taught. Now, does that mean every homosexual cannot be saved? No. There are homosexuals who have gotten saved and come out of that lifestyle. I know a few. And they've repented of it and are living uh, good, happy, um, heterosexual lifestyles now. All right? For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for the unnatural. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving their own... Um, persons the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a, a base mind or a debased mind or a reprobate mind to improper conduct. Now that's the revised standard version. I'm not particularly fond of it, but that's one of the verses that I could find. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 is clearly taught. This is a New King James Version is very clear about this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor what? Homosexuals or sodomites. That's so clearly taught. So some people say, well, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. Well, this is a New Testament verse. All right. Any sexual immorality, God's not going to allow because it dishonors him. It's, and anyone who's saved is going to repent of those things. Just like we're going to repent of being a thief. We're going to repent of being covetous nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. All right? Amen? Are you with me? Okay. Now, we have other doctrines we teach here that are not core doctrines. And give me five more minutes. We believe that God can heal. All right? We pray for people for healing. Now, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe God can heal, we're not going to keep you from becoming a member. All right? Now, does that mean healing is in the atonement? Yes, it is, but God's still sovereign. God determines if he's going to heal. We don't tell anybody, you have enough faith, God's got to heal you. God doesn't have to do anything. All right? When it says healing's in the atonement, that means, first and foremost, the, the one true healing that every believer gets is the healing of their spirits all right where our sins are forgiven your body is still growing old your body's dying friend listen please if you we were all perfectly healed we would never grow old all right so get that to your mind and you know our eyesights are getting worse wearing glasses you know gray hairs wrinkles weaker than we were when we were in our 20s and 30s 
the fact is, do we, do we believe by praying over someone or anointing them with oil that God's not going to heal them? Absolutely not. We do that all the time. We pray for people. We trust God for healing. We just don't say, you have enough faith, God's going to heal you. No, that's not scriptural, and that does more damage than good, right? Why? Why? Everybody understand that? Yeah. So we teach that, yes, because of the atonement, we can be healed, but God still calls the shots yeah. on that one, all right? All right. All right. Let's look at another one, then we're going to stop. We also teach that in, in the uh, gifts of the Spirit. And uh, we're going to do a whole class on that, although we do not force it. I have seen the abuse of the gifts of the Spirit too much. Okay? But we need them in operation. Do we believe that gifts are still for today? Yes, we do. We don't believe they passed away. But. I have seen churches abuse those things and they're not from God. I ask people to seek after the gifts. But do, uh, we don't come say, if you're not speaking in tongues, you're not saved. That's a bunch of baloney. Okay? Does everyone understand that? Ba the true baptism we get is when we're saved. But should we seek these, these gifts, these ministry gifts? Yes, we should. And we should be very open to them. But once again, be careful. Because there's so many nonsensical teachings out there concerning these. And once again, this is not a core doctrine. I've had people in this church say, I, I, I really, I, I, I've never been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues. I said, not all speak with tongues. Okay, notice that. The Bible clearly teaches that. Do all speak in tongues? Paul said, no. So don't worry about it. Maybe God wants to give you the gift of wisdom or the gift of knowledge, or the gift of faith. Who knows? Just seek after the gifts that God will, will give you. It's his gifts to give you anyway, not ours to take. All right? And once again, that's not a core doctrine. If you don't believe in speaking in tongues, we're not going to keep you from coming a member. <laughs> and, and we're not going to go around babbling all, all day in tongues, okay? Because that's an abuse. You know, we, i got to tell you the story before I get done. We had a, a lady in our church years ago and right in the middle, this was not here, this was when I was pastoring First Assembly of God in Iowa. Um, she had, it was her, her ministry to right at the end of the, the message to stand up and speak in tongues and interpret her own tongues and be very condescending. And she's one of these old Pentecostals with the tight bun and long dress and no makeup. And she believed any woman that wore pants was, uh, was a sinner. So... You know. And I, I, she did that a few times, and then one time she stood up right in the middle of the, of the service, started right in the middle, right at the end of my message, and started speaking. And I said, "Stop! The Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and you are putting words in his mouth." And, oh, you would have thought I was. I said, "The Holy Spirit does not interrupt," and she didn't like it. Because she thought that, man, if I feel like giving a message in tongues and interpreting my own tongues, that was the time to do it. These are why there are abuses in these things. You see what I mean? Be very careful. She didn't like it. Her and her husband left the church. I'm sorry. But the Holy Spirit does not interrupt. Okay? Everything's done in decency and order. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, it's time to stop. Um, so if you agree with the doctrines that we teach, the core doctrines, you can become a member. And um, if you don't, please see me and I'll, and I'll explain some things. But once again, it's all about unity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you've been able to give us the truth of your word. We want to honor you with the truth of your word. We don't want to dishonor you and believe things that are false. And we certainly do not want to spread anything that's false. So everything that we want to teach and everything we want to um, proclaim as being a disciple-making church, let it be fully 100% your will from your word so that we may glorify you and bring people to the saving grace as well as to walk in the faith daily. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Amen. We only